Hello there team. It is good to have everybody joining in again for another episode of Phil Shomo Coaching Podcast. Um, I'm just enjoying these interviews so much and uh, hope you are as well. If you're uh, getting something out of this, um, I'd love if you would subscribe um, either to the YouTube channel or to the podcast, uh, wherever you might be listening uh, to the podcast, and and maybe share it with a friend if you think it's valuable and helpful. Uh, We have some uh, great content coming up. I'm actually next uh, week, I'll be posting an interview I did um, with Rick Sessinghouse, who is Colin Morikawa's coach. Um, and Colin just uh, recently came off his second PGA Tour win and just an amazing interview. I can't wait for you to hear that. I've got some other exciting stuff coming up after that. A former LPGA player as, as well as a number of uh, different uh, areas with college coaches and so forth. So just really, really looking forward to that. If you'd subscribe, um, it will it will uh, really help me and um, would help you to make sure that you don't you don't miss an episode. Today I have a, a very special guest, and it's it's really my honor um, to have been able to sit down and talk to Dottie Pepper recently. Uh, pretty much everybody in the golf world knows who Dottie is. Um, we met uh, when she was here on Hilton Head Island, where I live, um, as part of the PGA Tour event, and had a chance to chat with each other for a few minutes, introduced um, by a mutual friend. And um, but this interview uh, just just truly amazing. Um, I'll I'll tell a little bit about her in the episode. Her history as uh, in the game of golf is amazing. As a player, she was just super successful and even dominant in the amateur ranks. Um, had an amazing LPGA career, including two major championships, uh, and then went on into uh, the broadcasting world, which. She's been in for many, many years now as part of the Golf Channel, NBC Sports, and currently her primary role is with CBS Sports. She also does uh, some writing, writes golf-related articles and so forth. And as she mentions in this interview, she's got a book coming out um, before too long. And I I cannot wait because Dottie's got this awesome mix of of humor um, as well as as insight and um, just incredible details. She's a fantastic follow on Instagram. She doesn't post a ton, as she said, but um, she posts some funny stuff. I'll give you an example of that right here. Um, And then she mentions in in this interview um, that she actually posts a lot of her notes and preparation materials and things that she keeps after events that she keeps archiving to keep growing and learning and getting better. And uh, I'll give you an example of that here as well. Um, Dottie is just uh, really valuable to gain insight and understanding from. If you're an athlete, this is going to be helpful for you. If you're a golfer, this is really going to be helpful to you, um, especially in the areas of preparation and what it means to really be prepared. She is, I think, the foremost expert in the golf world on that topic, um, which I love. I think you're going to, again, enjoy this immensely. Even if you're not an athlete or a golfer, this is just a fun conversation, and she's got insights that translate into all parts of the world. So grab a pen, paper, be ready to take some notes if you can, If you're, if you're, but if you're listening to this while you're out and about, just mark this episode because you're going to want to come back and pick up some of the gold that she drops. Uh, let's, let's just enjoy this, this conversation with Dottie Pepper. All right, welcome everybody. Good to have you back on the Phil Shomo Coaching Podcast, and I'm honored today to have Dottie Pepper as my guest. Welcome, Dottie. Thank you, Phil. It is so good because that's how we met. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dottie and I were introduced by a new friend of mine, a friend of hers for a while recently, and um, she was gracious to chat for a little while while when we first talked or we first met, and uh, has agreed to to chat today and. Dottie, I will I will have already given people some of your background, and, and a lot of people know a lot about you, but for anybody that doesn't, Dottie's one of the PGA Tour broadcasters for CBS Sports currently. She's also a columnist that writes regularly about golf and uh, was a highly successful player, which 
I think probably a lot of younger people don't know you from that part of your life. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit. Dottie, we actually have an unusual connection that you don't know anything about. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So your father was Don Pepper, who played Major League Baseball for the Detroit Tigers. And uh, in a March 1968 edition of Sports Illustrated, he was on the cover as one of the five best rookies of 1968. Correct. On that same cover, as part of the five rookies, was Johnny Bench. that guy, Johnny yeah. Bench. And I was about five years old and moved to Indiana and during the just at the beginning of the Big Red Machine days. And Johnny Bench was my favorite. And I remember I was I was probably five or six years old. I took a white T-shirt, wrote a number five on the back <laughs> and, and wrote Johnny Bench on it. So, you know, I mean, think of how close I was to putting pepper on the back of my God, shirt. The number would have been 32. <laughs> That is that I when I saw that I thought what that is just super cool. So I want I want to talk just a little bit like give us just a little bit of background for starters how you got in the game of golf. Um obviously with a major league baseball father, you came up in a in an athletic oriented home. Um but just give us a little bit about how you got how you got into it and then maybe also a little bit about what's what's really kept you so into it and and so much a part of your life now for all these years well i i got into it primarily i mean it, it, we all know that a lot of major league baseball players when they leave the game whether it's by their choice or an organization's choice or family choice it um it, golf is a pretty natural gravitating point for yeah. the the natural motion for the competition for being outside for a variety of things it happened to be his his mom that put a golf club in my hand for the first time. She had um, they had recently been put out of business at the, our, our huge turkey farm. We did forty five thousand head a year in upstate New York, and she remarried after my grandfather passed at age forty six. And the man she married played golf, uh, and after they went their separate ways, golf stuck, and it stuck for me because I didn't have to be taken to a practice, a, it was easy to go with grandma. She had lots of time. Um, she was a member at a small club about 25 minutes away. So transportation wasn't a problem. And I liked it because I could do it by myself. And it was something that, mm. it was hard. And to me that that was somewhat appealing. Um, we came from a skiing background, baseball background. My, the other side of the family was in the ski industry, still in the ski industry. So it was very athletic minded family competitive minded family and after you know i showed some i guess definite love of the game um uh, an affinity for playing at the game learning the game you know dad dad took over teaching me uh, in the in the best way he could and, and within you know, six or seven years i you know I, he couldn't he couldn't take what he knew from baseball and apply it to golf uh, anymore. So I ended up with um, a wonderful teacher in, in Saratoga Springs who had, had was retired and I became really his, his only student and it was sort of a student mentor sort of uh, relationship. Wow. So he was, he was nearly 80 years old when we started working together. Wow. How cool. How cool. Well, a lot of people, you know, I'll just give a little bit of the little bit of the story so your success uh as a player was uh just extensive you pretty much dominated amateur golf i think in the new york area for a while saratoga springs for sure locally and then in the state as an am and you made it to the lpga tour 17 wins two majors the 92 and the 99 nabisco dinosaurs um you were a six time i think member on the solheim cup uh, 20 matches, 13, five and two and 14 points. Uh, I mean, that's, that's just an incredible, incredible career. And, you know, one of my favorite things I, I say all the time on these podcasts, my phrase is forever learning that I want to never end the quest to keep learning and understanding. And I think success, I think it might've been Cameron, um, uh, Jordan's peace coach that that said uh, that success leaves a trail of breadcrumbs if you'll look for them. Um, so I, I would I I just love I love uh, 
learning from success, and I think you've got an extensive amount of it. Uh, you, you transitioned from being a player to a successful broadcaster in what I saw one, one person wrote as a seamless switch. Uh, <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> I don't I, know if you... <laughs> well, I, I, well, I talk to my golf ball all the time when I played, so why would I not talk, <laughs> talk about others now that I'm... Not that I'm out of the active playing part of the game anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, it's a, it's an interesting translation from one to the other because some people just think it's probably easy. You know, you know the game, you play the game, and there have been a number of players who are great as commentators or broadcasters. And I'm sure there's some things that translate easily. But tell us a little bit about for you what maybe some things that come to mind. What what translated easily, and what were some things that really you had to just unpack as sort of a whole new career. Well, I, I think it's all unpacking because you, mm -hmm. uh, I think people make transitions into other parts of their lives when they come in a little bit vulnerable and wanting to learn. And, and I've seen a lot of people come into, you know, this is my 17th year of, of working in, in right. golf. Industry. I'm really proud that I've literally done every job, uh, whether it was LPGA studio, um, sitting in as the main analyst in the Ryder Cup, I I've gone from top to bottom. Uh, walking reporter, main analyst for LPGA Live. I I've done every team match that there is. I've done, I I've done them all. Amazing. Uh, so I, I, I come. I'm reasonably proud of the fact that I've, I've sat in just about every seat. Uh, and, and I've been in a tower when a lead member of the international broadcast world died and had to get the show to New York. <laughs> and so that was always the, the bottom line when I worked at NBC under Tommy Roy's tutelage as the, the producer. Um, no, matter, no matter what, you have to be prepared for the 18th tower to go down or for the president to be shot. So if you, can get, if you can get the 18th tower, if you can take it from an outer tower or from the ground, or if you can get the show to New York if the president has been assassinated, um, the rest of it kind of seems pretty simple. <laughs> So, so that's sort of been my my mentality about that. But I, but I think, and, and I've told a, a lot of people that have tried to come into golf with a much better list of credentials than than mine, that this is much more a listening game than it is a talking game, mm. because you learn well to talk with when someone else is talking in your ear, but also to really listen to the people that you're working with because what you're trying to do is t try to tie together a story mm, or yeah. a counter argument through mm. a telecast, a bunch of golf geeks sitting around watching golf. I like to watch golf when I'm, when I'm not doing this. And those thoughts are constantly still running through my mind, but it's about listening to your fellow broadcasters, listening to the stories that are developing, being prepared for whatever might come. And I think if I, if I look back over my, my broadcast career, which I hope has a few more years in it. I'm a little, I'm a little too young to, to be home and driving myself and my husband crazy. Uh, I would think, I would like to think that when people look back at my career, whether it was playing or, or broadcasting, that preparation was, was the hallmark of it. Well, man, that's, there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, you know, I'm trying to work with some young golfers on understanding that golf doesn't have to just constantly be a game of surprises and unexpected shifts right and there's this sort of this sense i think from younger golfers that okay i've got a game plan but when the game plan goes sideways which you know as we all know that is golf it's it's that unexpected on the fly i wasn't ready for that and now i've got to make it up as i go and i know you've I've heard you say several times that you hate surprises, like unexpected <laughs> twists and turns. So how did you how did you take preparation both as a player and I know you're known for your extensive preparation now as a broadcaster? How how did you take that to in in a really on the path? I guess what I'm asking Dottie is what's the path of preparing so that in a game where so much is unexpected and so much shifts, you still sort of reduce or mitigate the surprise factor so that you're able to stay calm, navigate it with as much clarity of mind and focus as you can. I think you, 
you you practice as you, you you practice in a manner that is similar to your play. So in my philosophy is that if if you practice properly, you don't deserve to play well, but you should play well. Ooh, yeah, I, I would love to wow. wipe the word deserve out of the English language. I think it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> it really, uh, I think it sets sets people up for some things that are um, not not reasonable and and make make reality a lot more difficult. Yeah. But I, I think if you practice in a manner that mirrors play, put yourself in pressure positions. Don't get caught without your rain gear. I mean, simple as simple as stuff like that. Look at the weather forecast. Uh, be, know what the type of golf course you're playing, whether it's Parkland, whether it's a Linksdale golf course, what the grasses are. All of that goes into the preparation so that when you get there, there are no surprises. Mm -hmm. And when curveballs are thrown at you, you're a lot more likely to keep following them off and stay in the game because yeah. that, that's, that's really, I, I don't think, it's, it's really hard to do a perfect 180 pivot in a small space in a small time. But if you can keep following things off until you figure it out, if you keep staying in the game, hmm. you'll be fine. I love that. Well, it's one of many topics I was interested in, in uh, you know, picking your brain about because, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I, during COVID, I really got into doing some research from a from a, a social scientist, professor of psychology from New York University um, named Gabrielle Odigen. She's from Germany. And her study has been, hers and a number of others, has really been a 20-year study around how performance is affected not only by positive thinking, but and she actually wrote a book called Rethinking Positive Thinking. But the way she approaches it is positive thinking has a role but the big differentiator are those who anticipate obstacles beforehand and set an if-then plan beforehand. And the level of calm in their heart rate and all the monitoring we can do now on the human body, when you have thought about it and have some plan, is entirely different than when that obstacle or that adversity comes and you hadn't anticipated it at all. And it seems like while that we're never, golf is not a game where you'll ever get all of that figured out in advance. There's so many things that repeat themselves in rounds of golf. And I think you, uh, you know, you are to be applauded really for just sort of championing that your preparation is just never uh, finished, right? Well, that, that's true. And, and I, I look at preparation as um, as a journey, but also something. So, for example, in, in what I do now, I keep all of my my game day notes and they are scanned and into files that I can refer back to um, the next year, two years, three years, whatever it might be by tournament. And then I can you know, I have enough of a photographic memory that I can remember it. Yeah, I think that was Saturday. Or I think that was Sunday. Or that was a, a day I was in the tower. And I, okay, I, I can you know, I can look at a calendar and figure out where I was and what I was doing. But I, I think it's, it's it's cumulative. And one of the things I really didn't like doing as a player was coming there with my saddlebags empty, coming to a tournament. Wow. Um, I really felt like tournament was time to go play in the pro am and get your job done. It was not about trying to still figure it out from the bottom. It wasn't time to be changing clubs. It wasn't trying to be, you know, trying to trying a new shaft. You don't do that on Tuesday of a major. Um, I very often didn't have my coach with me. We did work uh, away and got to fly with whom you came. And I, I think that also is, is really good to remember because a lot of times you will have had great lead up into into going to a tournament, you may have made the club changes, the grip changes, the whatever changes you want to make, and you get to the golf course and you've got nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so. But, but if you put the work in, it's easier to unpack that panic, to know that okay, let's go back to the fundamentals. And if, if there's another hallmark, I would I would say uh, about how I prepared as a player and how I do this as a broadcaster, it's about keeping the fundamentals in mind mm. and you go back if you have a solid set of those to go back on the panic factors tends to kind of chill out 
Well, you just gave me a whole new framing. I had to write that down, unpack the panic like that. That's a skill, I think. That's like a, a skill to be learned. It lets you do that. Yeah, man, that is that is just fascinating. Uh, and, and I think there's, I think, I just think there's a lot of gap in the game today on that side. I think there's such a heavy emphasis on the technical and mechanical and all of the deep we've gone we're, we're diving so deep into the details which i think is helpful in many ways but it's like we're over saturated with the details in certain areas and we're just totally underdeveloped in the in, overall in the game on the stuff you just talked about well I, I think that science and the technology is pretty easy it's in our hands and, it, and, it, and it's, you know you can take a track man in less than you know, my backpack and there it is on the range and it tells you everything you need to know. Um, what, and, and it's pretty complicated, but I think that also translates to people trying to overthink the thinking. Yes. And absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's also very easy, especially on the PGA tour right now to have the team out there. Um, these guys are making a lot of money. <laughs> they need write-offs. <laughs> Sometimes they don't want to think for themselves and it's easy to have somebody out there to analyze your data, to get inside your brain when in fact it just takes a little dumbing down on your own mm. to look at how the day went. How did I prepare? How am I going to get better tomorrow? And know that we go back to the preparation. Was I prepared to play well today? Sometimes it doesn't happen. Right. You get the worst run of breaks on the golf course you can possibly imagine. Yep. And you got to suck it up and move on to tomorrow. But I just think there's an, a lot of overthinking about the thinking. And the bottom line is mm. I've got to, and, and I think the other thing too, if I was to be critical of today's sports psychology, it's one fits all. And yep. every human being is different. What makes them tick is different. Um, what makes them get fired up? What makes them calm down? All of that are different. If I tried to play as I did with one sports psychologist on even water, no shot. I was pathetic. If I figured out how I could release the energy, the frustration, the elation, and move on to the next shot quickly, that's where I did best. But for a, a sports psychologist to come in and, you know, it's one fits all for every one of his clients, every one of his students, his pupils, I'm not buying it because people aren't the same. Man, so true. I I spent a couple of days over the weekend at the Georgia Amateur over uh, at Atlanta Athletic Club. I had a couple of golfers playing in that, and and I've seen uh, one of them was a new client. One of them I've been working with for a long time, but just being with him over two days and not just seeing. I think this is what you guys do well. I think what you do exceptionally well in golf is not just see, you observe. That's a Sherlock Holmes thing where he, yeah. <laughs> he tells he tells Watson, you, the difference between you and I is we both see, but I observe. Right. And, and I was trying to really observe and not just follow the flight of the ball and, you know, get caught up in the ups and downs. And I literally, last night, I had a long conversation with, with his swing coach um, just around – observations that I had not seen before that are just unique to him. And I thought if I hadn't been out there for that many holes over two days, I don't think I would have picked that up from the one-on-one -on -one sessions we do or just seeing him on a driving range or something. like. It's the difference between the laboratory and the field. Big, <laughs> big difference. And you know, my, my teacher, I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book about the letters he left me over the course of the nearly six years that we worked. Um, before he passed away. He, after every lesson, and oftentimes in between lessons, um, he, on his old typewriter, I mean, the heavy bang, bang, bang sort of typewriter with the tape and, and move, the, move the paper through the reel, he wrote me over 100 letters. And there are such great nuggets about that sort of stuff in there. And mm. things that he was, a, he was an always learner. Uh, constantly reading about the best players in the game and curious about club making and agronomy and, and the mental side of the game that one of the things that he always talked about was being just being aware of whether you're 
your opponent's taking longer over a shot or you see their their pre-shot routine break down or just being aware. And I remember distinctly the year I won the women's amateur in New York. Um, my opponent, we had we were all square through 10 holes and her routine changed and I, I got her. And ended up, I ended up winning a pretty good run of holes there and, and ending it. But it, it was that sort of thing that you can't teach in a laboratory. You can't you can't plug somebody into a zoom session and have a one-on-one -on -one. you got to be out there and see it feel it hear it and all of that that goes into com competitive sports that's so good we we never get away from the fact that we're still human beings playing yeah. a game you know i i uh it was interesting i was listening to a, a an author recently who had written a book about poker and how poker translates to life and she was make she was making this comment about how artificial intelligence has solved chess and we've solved some other games, but we've never solved poker. And I would say we've never, you know, artificial intelligence will never solve golf because, no. <laughs> because the human factor is never static, right? It's never as definable as the machines, even though they have, I know, a place. Um, I, I want to pivot just a little bit, and I, I don't know, this might be, I don't know if this is an unusual topic for you, if you've ever been asked this. This is based off of, I, I, two things made me think of this. So one is, I've heard you talk, and you talked a little bit ago about being raised by an athletic father. Uh, your grandmother was a big influence on your game, um, and and some of how you were raised in, within that environment, and then obviously with your coach that you've talked about created in my opinion a sort of a real holistic development of the way you approach to the game um, that wasn't quite as robotic or as just you know uh, trying to perfect certain things as much as learning to play and and the connection between that and comments I've heard you make about Justin Thomas's parents uh, Mike and Janie I think are their names and you said you've walked many times with them and you've observed a lot. And I think at one point you even mentioned that from what you've seen, they're just real role models for parents of elite young golfers. I've got a number of young golfers, uh, even over at, in Atlanta, I walked with parents um, in those tournaments and the conversations we have over the hours of watching their son play while I'm observing are so rich and they're so hungry to actually know how to effectively parent a really good young golfer. So I know you don't have a young golfer play and that you're not, you're not on the parent uh, side of it, but given what the way you came up and what you've observed, uh, and I'm sure you've seen all kinds of other parents besides just Justin's parents inside the ropes, what kind of thoughts do you have? Like when you say my, that Justin's parents are really a role model or sort of set the bar, what kind of thoughts are in your mind about what role parents can play and what's effective in that when their golfer is really coming up through the elite ranks? I, I've, I've often said that Janie and Mike are what I consider the best golf parents I see on the PGA tour. Um, they they enjoy watching their kid play well they know it's not going to be every day that he plays well but they're out there and often you'll have mike with a beer in his hand and they're out there holding hands walking down the fairway or you know kind of stealing away through the trees on a on a shady cart path and they're and i actually watched him actually when, when he was playing amateur golf as well and they're hands off uh, even mike is his teacher we we know that um, but even when, when they're on the range and things aren't going great, it's all about the fundamentals. I've never, ever watched a session that they've had that it wasn't just about alignment, the basic of getting the, the club back on a good path, not, maybe not a perfect path, but a good path, and making solid, consistent contact. How do I do that? Because that's unpacking that panic. That's yeah. all of that yes. going back to the fundamentals. And I think... If you have a kid that is intrigued by the game and wants to take a longer path into the game, you need to look at yourself first and figure out 
what's my role in this? Is it because I want my kid to get a college education? Is it because I want my kid to have a great experience in junior golf? Is it because I want my kid to understand what competitive sports is about? Is it the autonomy of playing golf? Because it's just you. <laughs> Unless you get to college golf and then there's team, but it's still you. Yep. Or is it really about me and something that I didn't get to achieve when I was in that position or things that I felt I missed out on? So I think there's, mm. there's that personal time. You got to figure out why. why. Why are we doing this? And when those other things, successful or not successful, come your way, if you figured that out, the rest of it seems to make a whole lot more sense. Mm. If you're out there because you want this for your kid and your kid doesn't really love it, there's going to be a lot of tears and a lot of heartache. And that's, that's the hard part that I, that I see. And, and I also, I saw it even when I was playing junior golf, that the kids, mm. they were fine. I mean, they, they liked golf. Okay. There were other things they probably liked more. I'm doing this because mom and dad said, I probably should do this. And I also saw it in college and with players that were among the best junior players. And there were a lot of them that went on to play in my era, play professional golf. And there weren't many of them that you could tell, even as they got into college golf, that they truly loved it. Hmm. They loved the hard parts of it. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's parents having that hard conversation with themselves that makes things a lot easier for their kids. Yeah. I can't even tell you how rich that is. Um, I had a junior golfer who was pretty good and I don't think I did that part very well. I don't think I did the why very well. Um, you know, fortunately he loves the game now and that's our, our favorite thing in the world is for me and my two sons to play, uh, competitive together, but it, it's, it's reflecting on that part of my life, um, that partly has me asking questions like that because I want to, I, I think there's a hunger. I mean, some, some parents are just, it's just totally over the top and all that, but there are a lot of parents who really want to do it well. There's just not that m many role models. There's not that much guidance on how to do it well. And I think what, thank you for sharing that, Dottie. I think what you just said um, can go a long way, can help me with some of my conversations with parents. I have, I have one of my very best friends from college golf is she teaches in Central Virginia and she faces this every day. Mm -hmm. She's got some kids that are just getting into the game, junior golf camps, as you know, with the pandemic are a big deal because you can still social distance and have a junior golf camp and have a darn good one. So she's, right. she's got very, very full days and evenings right now, but she also has a couple of really good players and, and some of them that have gone on to college. And one of the things she says, get them to the golf course early, make sure they've got enough water. They've got something to keep their energy level up and get the heck out of there. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> so, um, <it's>, she's right. <laughs> she's That's right so in a good. lot of ways. <laughs> because it's not like, you know, when I was playing junior golf, you know, you had to coordinate somebody to come pick you up and, you, you know, you had to get out of the pay phone and, and all that. Figure, you know, if there had been a rain delay or whatever, mom, I'm, you know, two hour rain delay, I'm going to come later. You got you to call them. Right. <laughs> text your mom and say, you know, so it's a lot easier now. But it's also a lot easier to be clawed in because of this, too. So drop them off, get them there plenty early. Make sure they got fuel for the day, whether it's hydration and or food, and get out of there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, it's so good. You, you and I, you and I would be in the uh, era that would know what it meant to make sure you got a lot of quarters. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. You got enough quarters? Got enough. Because <laughs> you got, might have to make an emergency That's phone exactly call from right. somewhere. Exactly right. <laughs> well, let's pivot a little bit. You, uh, we're recording this in the middle of a little bit of a unique situation where uh, two tournaments in a row are at Muirfield Village um, in Dublin, Ohio. Um, Dottie, I don't know if I had mentioned this to you. I lived in Columbus, Ohio for 27 years before moving down here. And Muirfield uh, never had the chance to play it. I didn't run in those circles. But Muirfield was my, the first place I ever saw a, 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 a tournament up close took my oldest son when he was about seven or eight and Tiger was on his 1997 run after the Masters and uh, my son 
Tiger slapped him five like three times on that same day that we were there he up against the ropes. Hand, right? <laughs> yeah, it was just just wild. And and I would take him out of school, make up excuses to get him out of school every year to go out there. So that was just uh, that's a dear place to me, and I know it is to you too. And when I'd, I'd, if we had time, I'd love for you to tell a bunch of your stories with your history of Mirfield Village, but. We're in between the tournaments this past Sunday. You uh, walked with Justin Thomas and Victor Hovland and Colin Morikawa. What an amazing final round. One of those you just – we all pain, are pained that the fans aren't out there, but that that was an epic one that the fans would have had a big big factor in. Um, it, it's interesting to me as I was watching that on uh, this past Sunday and listening to you, you know, it was just shortly ago that Justin Thomas was the young gun. And when you're a young gun, I think you're, you know, you're driven to prove to the established stars that you're there. You mean business. You're somebody yeah. to be dealt with. Now he is an established star. He is as big, you know, about as big as it gets. And he had two guys who are the new young guns. So it's interesting to me, what what's the difference mindset that it takes for a Justin Thomas to move out of the, I'm always looking at those guys that are there and I want to prove myself to them versus I got guys coming after me now and I've got to be motivated by a little bit uh, from a little bit of a different angle. And then I know as you get older, you know, in the latter part of your career where in, on the tour where Phil's at now and other people, now you're like trying to prove you can still do it. Like, so it, it's from a mental standpoint, it's an interesting kind of progression. And Sunday was like a laboratory of watching that with Justin and those two young guys. Uh, what, what's your, what's your take on just how that shifts from the early years of proving yourself to the, I've proved myself now I got to be motivated by guys who want what I got. I don't think you're ever going to have to worry about Justin Thomas in a third <laughs> Not him exactly. That's true. No. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, he's fifth in the world now. Yeah, you know, uh, think he moved up over the weekend, came in the weekend fifth. And this is a guy who's got a, gotten a taste of number one. Yeah. And he also got a taste of becoming number one. And he didn't have a golf club in his hand. He did it on a week that the numbers just turned out that way. I think he wants to feel that in a little different manner. Yeah. Um, but sure, there's always people tugging at you, pulling, pushing you from behind. And I, I think I take the, I'm going to go back to the 1990, the, the inaugural Solheim Cup. And we had Kathy Whitworth, the American did as American side as a team and extremely heavily favored. Kind of a, take a biblical term, David and Goliath sort of sort of situation with the European tour. It was, it was a really pretty, pretty fledgling tour with a lot of very good players on it, but not the depth that the American, American team had. And Kathy's advice was people that are put in situations like you're about to go into where you are heavily favored, expected to play well, Justin having the lead, uh, expect those underneath to find a will, a well of how to play their best ever. Oh yeah, wow. And that might've been bigger than one day at Muirfield Villas in the Workday Charity Classic or Charity <laughs> Open. But I think you go back to that sort of mindset that yeah, People that are, that are maybe a little bit of an underdog are going to find their best stuff because they're playing with the best. Wow. And mm. to be prepared for that. Mm. Uh, mm. But I think there's, there's a self push. There's a, there's a desire to get back to you know, for Justin to get back to the, being the number one player in the world. And he's, he's got a plan to do that. Yeah. And these guys coming up, they want that same thing for us as broadcasters. It's going to be fascinating to watch because it means a lot of really great Saturdays and Sundays. That's right. <laughs> that is so right. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it is interesting how, you know, some players, Justin would definitely be in this camp. And I think I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about Colin Moore Cower, the winner uh, as well. And it would appear early on that he would be in the camp where there's some players you, you just, you just know, you have a sense they're not going to be thrown off by something sort of traumatic happening. You know, Colin did it, lost that, 
tournament recently at, out in out in Texas, and Justin did it Sunday. But we're not sitting here going, "Oh man, I hope Justin's okay." Like, oh, he might just. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I do want to talk about Colin just a little bit. I, I'm fascinated with Colin's coach, uh, Rick Sessinghouse, and who's taught him since he was eight. And I heard Rick recently describing how Colin's training growing up included a lot of heavy focus on creativity, imagination, seeing shots that aren't easily seen. And then he said, And the key is Colin learned how to trust that, to trust what he sees. You, you've, you've often mentioned that, that one, your, one of your early lessons on covering Tiger was never say there's no shot. (laughs) I learned that from Roger Maltby because I think Roger, the way he put it, he said, that guy can make a, make you look like a fool faster than anybody else. (laughs) Yes. So, so yes, put the filter on as a broadcaster, right? So is there some opportunity in that space? To me, it just seems so interesting. And I know some of it is inherent. Some of it is natural, probably. Um, But just this idea that training can also push towards creativity and imagination and then learning to trust that side of yourself when again, a lot of my work is is younger golfers or even even early pro guys trying to make it in the mini tour world or work their way up, whose entire basis of trust is on their swing and whether it's working that day. And as, as soon as but as soon as the shot shape isn't exactly right, even if it's playable, they're already falling off of the confidence wagon because of that. And this idea of trusting something else that's more athletic, that's more creative, that's more imaginative. I know Tiger plays that way, and it looks like Colin really plays that way. Is there a, is there a sense that you have that, man, we're just – there's unexplored territory there, or maybe it's back to what some of the older generations actually knew about the game more than what we focus on now? Well, my thought. <laughs> <laughs> And go back to a guy like Trevino. Oh, he, yeah. You look at mechanics. The one thing you could count on was that that golf club was going to get back there square. It was going to be flush, <laughs> and it was moving at a accelerating pace. Uh, I, I see so many players today at so many levels that have – they could get their snail mail on the driving range, and they hardly ever go to the golf course. Where do you learn if your training is only a small part of what we're trying to do. And I I was really lucky when I lived on the West coast of Florida that Paul Azinger was one of my practice partners. Mm. And I learned to hit bunker shots from Paul Azinger. And it was, it gets, gets. and where did he hold out the magical bunker shot right here at at Mirfield village? Absolutely. But one of Paul's things was, was all about creativity and where did he learn how to hit bunker shots from? Sevi Ballesteros, mm. oh, the, yeah. the king of creativity. With the three iron. <laughs> of course, of course. And so we would get in the bunker and he would just he'd grab the shag bag and he would literally throw it from one end of the bunker to the other. And you had to hit every shot wow. out of there to the same hole. So gather them all up, throw them all down again and hit it to a different hole. So you might be in the same part of the bunker, but you have a different a different um, hole that you're trying to hit it to. So it it really brought in imagination and creativity. So you want to mix up your practice, but you can't just do that. And you practice from imperfect lies. You just scattered, smothered, and covered like you've gone to the Waffle House. I want them all over the place. (laughs) But then, but that doesn't, still doesn't take you into the trust of when it has to go to where, the golf. You have to go play. And you've got to play in really crappy conditions when you really don't want to be out there in a rain suit when it's heat index of 105 and everybody else is, you know, backyard barbecue and hanging out at the beach. Uh, you, you got to put that time in and put that time in because that's going to happen when you have to put a, put a number on the board. So mm. you play in lousy conditions, you build that trust, you play from imperfect lies, you build that trust. Mm. And so when things aren't perfect, I mean, like I went to the Q school in the fall of 87 with a case of the shanks. You talk about having to rely on something to get it around. 
uh, and I unloaded one, A, in, a in, in a practice round. Nobody wanted to play with me the second day. <laughs> that, was, that was practice round day one. And I unloaded one making a, making a run to get my card on the final day. Oh, On the 11th mercy. hole. Yep, right in the middle of the lake. And I made five and ended up getting my card. Had, you know, shot 69 and passed the world by that day. But I unloaded one in the middle of, of the second nine. Oh. And you talk about needing some trust. But you don't do that unless you've put yourself in really crappy positions mm. and failed and succeeded. Oh, I love it. Mine, I love it. Could you please write a book just on unpacking the panic <laughs> and use your whole Shanks story <laughs> as part of the ma massive learning curve? I mean, come on. We need it in the golf world. <laughs> it, it, sounds, it sounds kind of old baseball school simple, but that was how, to, how I kind of came up. <laughs> Old is becoming new again, I believe, Dottie. So we're we're I think we're heading back there. Uh, you're you're so gracious with your time. I I'm so fascinated by your take on on these nuances, not just the obvious stuff. That I could talk to you for for hours, and I'll put the reins on myself here. So um, I do want to I, I I try to end every interview I do with what I call the back nine, and uh, it's just sort of quick uh, rapid response. You can expound if you want to, but uh, you don't no need to. And you know the Masters doesn't begin till the back nine on Probably Sunday. Nine. <laughs> That's exactly right. You you and Mark Immelman both corrected with the exact same line. So yes, Augusta will be proud of you guys. <laughs> the second nine. So so here here we go. I'll just and again I've tried to I've really tried to ta tailor these for things that I wanted to ask you. So. Uh, favorite thing you did during the COVID lockdown before the tour kicked back up? Started this book. Oh, yeah. very Started cool. It's been in my back pocket for a while, but it it's um, it's happening. Oh, thank you for that. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Um, second one, you've said that interviewing Justin Rose after he lost the Masters in 2017 was the hardest interview you've ever had to do. What's something now that we're over three years removed from that? What's something from that interview that stuck with you? I think it was his patience and his professionalism because we iced him for a really long time. Uh, wow. going, through, going through the, the shot, 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 all the reaction shots of, of Sergio's win. And we kept that guy waiting for a long time and he was hurting. And he, he gave a really professional and, and heartfelt interview. Wow the character rises in moments like that right how beautiful uh third one most memorable moment from your stellar solheim cup playing career you probably have a bunch but just one that you remember that jumps out in your mind when you think about the solheim cup okay so we, we've talked about preparation throughout this whole thing and i'm going to take you back to day one hole one walking so we were match number two is kathy Garing, billy kratzer's younger sister and myself were a team and we had played three days of practice where Kathy was playing when we're playing foursomes Kathy's playing the odd numbered shots so it's true foursomes in in the Solheim Cup and in the Ryder Cup where you pick who's going to play from the odds and evens and Kathy yeah. and I had played prepared for this with her playing the odds the entire time and we're walking on the car path down to the first tee at Lake Noda and she says dot I can't do it I said, we can't do what? Said, I can't hit the first tee shot. I said, well, I got you covered. <laughs> so we we played foursomes in a, in, a, in a manner we'd never played before, and we put a point on the board. <laughs> wow, what a great story. I can't do story. it. Okay, I got you covered. <laughs> my goodness. All right, well, I'm going to be telling that in my teaching sessions <laughs> for the rest of my life. Thank you. <laughs> Good gracious. Again, I'm putting the reins on because I'd love to ask more about that. All right. Now, fourth question. Toughest competitor you competed against during your playing career? Randy Just, Burton. Really? Randy Burton. No, no question about it. Wow. Unexpected answer. Interesting. Interesting. Again, I'll hold off. That's there's just so much behind that. Okay. Number five, something you love about being part of a PGA broadcast team that most people wouldn't automatically think about if they, even if they are obsessive watchers and listeners. I, I love listening to a show come on the air because it is, there is 
heart chants and that nothing happens when they three, two, one, go. <laughs> All of these things have to be so lined up and everybody has to be so on the, on, on one page. And I've been part of shows that nothing happened when three, two, one, go happens. Um, one in Corning, New York, that the production manager, tech, tech director, they forgot to have the generator filled with fuel the day, night before. And literally Oops. as three, two, one happened, no. So, uh, yeah, I, I, my favorite part is just getting on the air. Oh, man. The adre there's adrenaline there's just adrenaline. with that. <laughs> Seven years later, there's a lot of adrenaline still. The magic of coming on the air. Oh, I love that. My word. I, uh, number six, I have no idea whether you have an answer to this or not. You're welcome to say, eh, I can't think of anything. <laughs> Do you have any rituals or a closest thing maybe to a ritual that before a big broadcast, you don't feel ready to go unless you've crossed that T or dotted that I? Like, what, what's a, what would be the closest thing for you to a ritual so you're, you know you're ready? My yardage book is, is my ritual. I, pr I prepare as a player. Mm -hmm. uh, I know where, where I can miss it, where I can't, where players can miss it, where I can't. I know which way. The, if I haven't checked the weather, bad. I don't know which way the wind's going to blow, how holes are going to change. Um, that I would not be prepared for. But if that yardage book is ready to go, I can handle quite a bit. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, number seven. One characteristic you see in great players over these years, you've been able to be so close to them in the heat of competition. What's, what's a characteristic you see that even as successful as you were, you wish you would have developed it more when you were a player or when you were growing up? I think there, there, are, there are some players who have a little more um, ability to let things roll off their backs better mm. than others. Um, and part of it, again, is it, not everybody's the same. Some people yeah. you know, can dump it in the trash bin real quickly and others have to hang on to it a little bit longer um, and the quicker you can react to it in your normal way and and get rid of it I, I think that's that's something that I still could have could have done better but players who have that their way their way being the, the key part of getting rid of that and moving on are, are, are ones that I really admire that's a, a phenomenal answer and and Dottie is known for those of you who aren't paying attention. Dottie is, is known as a fiery competitor. Uh, there's some legendary stories around sure. all of that. Fine. And <laughs> <laughs> we won't we won't go into any of that. But it's 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 fascinating to me. I love how you're saying you know because this is again it is parallels and sort of affirm some of the way that I'm trying to work with golfers is the reaction stuff, the even the emotional stuff. It's not automatically bad it's not automatically something that doesn't have a place in the game like it's not you are a unique person it's how you learn to either use that or allow that to use you that sort of becomes the 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 tipping point and i know that was for you that i think you used that as part of your success yeah I did. And, and i think you know even bigger picture uh, so look at the time we're sitting now in the midst <laughs> of a worldwide pandemic are you going to let it use you? Mm. Or are you going to figure out how you can use it to make you better? Absolutely. Absolutely. My, my business tagline is adversity to advantage because I think we all face the adversity equally over the course of a long enough event. All golfers face it. Some are going to deal with it better than others, and that's probably, in my mind, the biggest advantage going on on the golf course. We'll keep moving. Number eight, uh, you know, we always tend – to think that modern is better, uh, in some ways it is. We've touched on this already. Um, maybe one more thing that previous generations, you, you've got a great connection with the history of the game and the greats of the game and your coach with all of those, you know, th things in your mailbox and all the books and all that way of training you. He was not only teaching you the history of the game, he was connecting you to the the bigger values that these greats of the game had functioned with. Well, what's something else that comes to mind in that space that your sense is, and I know we, we sound like just a, two old fogies probably here. So what, what's your sense of just something that might be slipping away a little bit in the modern game that 
we're probably either going to come back to or we're going to regret that we lost it. I, I look at the overall game and overall maybe youth sports and mm. think that uh, one of the things that he talked about talked about a lot was you know there are going to be things that are really disappointing and that to take things slowly don't be in any big hurry uh to to move on to tomorrow without learning from today and also you know don't be in a hurry to like you know i i won on the on the symmetric tour on the futures tour then as an amateur and I'd been low amateur in the open, in the women's open, and and I'd had a lot of really, really good things happen in my amateur career. And people were saying, "Well, it's time to turn pro." Well, I'm not in that big a hurry. And I didn't I didn't come from a lot of money. It was it was hard to play amateur golf, but I was also taught that you need to have a plan B. So don't be in such a big hurry to ditch plan A, uh, or get to plan A if you don't have a plan B. Uh so good thank you thank you for that last question i ask every guest this in one way or another some people it kind of stumps but you know you're a professional talker so <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> this might this might be okay for you so if people who know you the best were to use a word or phrase that everybody else who knows you well would know they were probably imitating dotty or pretending to be dotty um, and we listen to you all the time on TV, but what's a word or phrase that you think, man, I use that a lot and people would, who know me well would know I use that a lot. You know, I, I I'm going to go back to my early training with, with NBC and pride myself on not using the same word a lot Good. Uh, there you go. to, to not the word great, hate it, or use it, use it sparingly. Uh, I really try hard and I, I watch a lot of shows to make sure I don't fall into using the same words all the time. And not that, that you have to be, you know, with a thesaurus in your back pocket either, but to describe things in, in different ways. And I think that comes from, from reading, from observing, from listening rather than talking. That's really good. So you're so in other words, you're a hard person to imitate. <laughs> Probably not for some, but <laughs> I try not to fall into the same clicky cliche thing drives me nuts. Let's put it that yeah, way. That's, that that's that's so good. drives me nuts. But uh, I try try not to fall into the same ruts, the same ticks. Well, that's a pattern that we all need to learn from. Thank you for setting that pattern. Dottie, you've just been fantastic today. This is I don't know if anybody else will, even if nobody else ever hears this, this is one of my favorite conversations I've ever had with anybody. Your insights are so rich. Your perspectives are so shaping. And I'm going to, I've got boatloads of stuff that I can start working with golfers on. So thank you. You want to tell listeners a little bit about how they can find you online or follow you? You're not that hard to find, but. I'm not, but I'm only on one social media uh, platform. And that's at Instagram. And it's just me with a underscore in between. Um, I don't, I, I'm on there, but I, I don't, I'm not driven by it, but, um, and I, you know, I'm going to have a website up for the, for the book and it, it'll be under Dottie, Good. Dottie, Dottie Pepper dot net. So that'll, that'll be, uh, in the works and hopefully have this book, uh, in hands by masters of 21. Oh, awesome. Well, I'll just encourage people. You talked earlier about your preparation and you just posted yesterday. I think you posted a whole batch of your notes and all that stuff that you're taking away from from the event on Sunday and it was fun to just see that and thank you for pushing that preparation envelope further this was again this was a privilege and thank you so much for your time daddy you're fantastic really enjoyed it thank you Phil. all right thank you